Hello guys and welcome to another calculus video. In this video we are going to be starting off the integration guide series and this is going to be part one of four for our videos on contour integration. So we're going to be covering um, all the all, all, everything about contour integration right from the very basics. The only thing that you need to know for this video is a base, the basics of the complex plane, what is a complex valued function, and how to calculate um, complex exponentials and complex logs. You don't need to know any very uh, in-depth complex analysis because we're going to cover all of that in this series. So if you already know a lot of complex analysis, maybe you'll have, want to skip to the next video. But anyway, uh, I'm really excited to start this series, so let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing we need to cover is what exactly is contour integration? I mean, it's definitely not the same as normal integration, and you'll see why. So I have here the real and complex analogs right here. As you can see, our real integral can be stated as the integral from a to b of f of x dx. And so what that looks like if we drew a number line is just like this. We're starting at point a, we move as these arrows indicate to the right from a to b. And we're adding up all the values on this line and we're also multiplying by dx. So dx is obviously a real number in this situation. However, this is what a contour integral looks like. And you'll notice that I put a little c right here and that indicates that that's the curve over which we're integrating. So this is a curve that we call curve C. Also, you can see this little circle on the uh, integration symbol, and that just means that our curve C is a closed curve, meaning it starts and ends at the same point. So this is our curve C, and as you can see, we're integrating f of z dz over this curve, which means that we're adding up all these different points. However, something that's actually different from normal integration is that our dz value is not just an infinitesimally small number, it's also a complex number as well. So you can see dz equals dx plus i dy if x is our real part and y is our imaginary part. So x and y are real numbers, but dz is a complex number, which just indicates the difference jumping from one point to another. Also, conventionally, contrapaths are almost always going to go in a counterclockwise direction. So if uh, the direction isn't specified on anything, you can always go ahead and just assume that they're going to be oriented counterclockwise. Now we can also have non-closed contour paths, and those are not going to have this little circle here, but they'll still have an indicator of the curve that they're on. So here's a more formal definition of our uh, contour integration. So if we have a curve, which we uh, the classic Greek letter to use for that is lowercase gamma. So if we have a curve that is lowercase gamma, then the integral, contour integral, over that curve, notice that we don't have a circle here because, again, gamma does not necessarily have to be closed, is defined by this limit. And if you're familiar with the limit notation for normal integration, you'll notice that this is just the integral from 0 to 1 of f of gamma of t times gamma prime of t dt. And so if we were to substitute u equals gamma of t, then that would essentially just give us the integral from the starting point to the ending point, right? So what, gamma of t is just tracing out the curve gamma of 0 and 1. Now this limit notation isn't necessarily be very important to us, but it's, it is important to understand you know, the basics of how we are defining things when we get into the more hairy um, sides of contour integration. So one thing that this does actually mean is, first of all, if we have multiple curves which add up to become a third curve, in this example we have this curve gamma 1, which is on top, and this another curve gamma 2, which is on the bottom, you can see that if we add these curves together, we make a third curve that starts from this point, goes all the way around, and then ends right here. And so we, if we call that gamma 3, then the integral of f of z dz over gamma 1 plus the integral of f of z dz over gamma 2 equals the integral of f of z dz over gamma 3, which is pretty straightforward. I mean, just think about it. If you have the integral from a to b of f of x plus the integral from b to c of f of x, it's the same as the integral from f of x of f of x from a to c. So that's essentially the real analog right here. So I have some practice problems. If anyone wants to try to use the limit definition here, um, I'm going to have a lot of practice problems throughout this series just to check your understanding so that you can know if you're all caught up. So practice problems right here are to use the limit definition of a contour integral to calculate the integral over gamma of just dz. And so we're, we have three different examples here. In example one, our curve gamma goes from z equals 1 minus i to z equals 1 plus i in a straight line. And then you can read these starting points and any points for these other curves. Uh, in this curve, this curve goes from this point to this point. I didn't put the arrow there. So if you want, you can try these practice problems, but the limit definition is not necessarily the most important thing. So if you don't want to try that, that's okay. One other thing we have to cover is 
most importantly, I think, in this video is why do we do contour integration? After all, we are literally making the integral more complex. So why are we going to do that? And the reason for this is that the integral is more complex but easier. And I have this little, uh, we'll cover this formula quite uh, in the next video, I believe. But you can see that this um, integral actually just turns into a sum. And this is actually not even an infinite sum. It's a finite sum that you can just compute by hand. And this residue actually represents a limit. So we take a contour integral. Now, integrals are really hard to solve, especially if they don't have an elementary antiderivative. And we just turn it into a limit. And that is the whole point of complex integration. Complex integration is incredibly easy to do because integrals just become simple limits. And if we can combine our knowledge of complex integrals and real integrals, we can solve real integrals much more easily. So one other thing we have to cover right here is simply the fact that uh, simply an anti differentiation here. So f of z is an antiderivative of f of z, um, capital F for the first one. Same thing as with real integration, the integral from a to b of f of z dz is capital F of b minus capital F of a. Pretty straightforward. It's the same thing as real integration. Now, this is actually not too important to deal with because we are almost never going to have a situation where this is useful to us because we only pretty much only deal with functions that uh, don't obey this rule or don't have an empty derivative. So this is not really something to worry about right here, but it's just a statement that might be handy to know. So now we're going to discuss the topic of analytic and holomorphic functions. Now, technically, analytic and holomorphic have two different definitions. I have this image from Wikipedia right here that you can see. A holomorphic function is defined by a function that is complex differentiable. So that essentially means that you can take the derivative in the complex plane, and that means that the derivative, no matter which direction you go, like you could go in the positive direction, in the negative direction, in the i direction, in the negative i direction, or in any other direction in between, at any angle, the derivative is going to be the same. That's what complex differentiable means. And analytic means that a function is locally equal to its own Taylor series, or in some cases, Lorentz series, uh, which we will discuss later. And a fundamental a assumption of complex analysis is that if a function is holomorphic, that function is also analytic. So we can use these definitions sort of interchangeably. And the good thing for us is that most functions are actually holomorphic. So for example, z to the n, sine of z, and e to the z. And anytime we compose any of these functions with each other, you know, we add them together, we divide them or whatever, our function will still be completely holomorphic. So that's very nice. In general, most functions are going to be holomorphic that you look at. The only exception to this, well, there are a few exceptions, would be at singular points. So a singular point is essentially where a function diverges to infinity, usually when you have a zero in the bottom or some other similar situation. Uh, this doesn't include removable singularities. So remo if, if a singularity is removable, for example, sine of z over z over zero, uh, at, at z equals zero, then that doesn't count at as a singularity and our function is going to be analytic at that point. So here are some examples of points where certain functions are not analytic. So 1 over z squared is analytic everywhere except at the point z equals 0 because it has a singularity right there. 1 over z squared plus 1 at z equals plus or minus i, sine of 1 over z at z equals 0 because again of that singularity, and cosecant of z at z equals n pi for n is an element of the integers. So that just means that this has infinitely many discontinuities or singularities, and those are all points where um, this function is not analytic, but everywhere else it is analytic and holomorphic. The only exceptions to this rule is essentially going to be uh, weird functions like modulus of z, or absolute value of z, however you want to say it, and z bar, which is the complex conjugate of z. These are holomorphic and analytic nowhere in the complex plane because of the way that they uh, act. They're just not, they're not normal functions, essentially. And the functions natural log of z and z to the p, uh, p just represented power, where power, uh, where the, where p is not an integer, these are going to have what are called branch cuts, which means that they're analytic in most places, but there is a large section of the complex plane where they are not analytic, and we will discuss those later. So now that we know what an analytic function is, there will be some practice problems at the end of the video if you want to go try those now. But now we're going to discuss Cauchy's Integral Theorem. And Cauchy's Integral Theorem essentially states, if f of z is analytic in some domain, then for any simple closed curve c in the domain, the contour integral, closed contour integral, 
uh, over c of f of z dz equals zero. Now, I've removed most of the math terminology from this definition to make it a little bit more straightforward, but if we want to remove even more, the basic statement is that if f of z is analytic everywhere inside of the curve c, so for example, in this case we have our curve c1, so everywhere inside of this curve and everywhere on this curve, so everywhere where the red line is and everywhere inside of the red line, if it's analytic in all those places, then we can state that the contour integral is going to be equal to zero. And the same thing with C2 here. This is our domain right here where the function is analytic on everywhere inside the circle. So the integral over C1 and the integral over C2 are both going to be zero because these are both closed curves. So that's a very, very powerful statement and it's the formation of much of contour integration. Now, there are going to be some practice problems on this, but there are also some other topics that we have to discuss here. There's something called contour deformation, and this is another very important topic. Now, these x's right here represent poles or singularities of the complex function. So that means that within this domain here, our function is not analytic, which means that the integral of f of z over c1 is not necessarily zero. We can't calculate it. We don't know what the value is. But a statement that we can make is that the integral over c1 is the same as the integral over c2. And the reason for this is everywhere inside c2 is the same as c1. And I'll show you what that means in a moment. Let's imagine a third curve, C3. Now, C3 looks a lot like C2. It has this outer circle, right, that matches up exactly like C2. And it has this inner circle that goes uh, counterclockwise here, while C1 actually goes clockwise. So essentially, since these integrals go in opposite directions, it's like integrating from A to B or B to A. It's just uh, going to be a minus sign. So if we add C1, plus our function, plus our curve C3, the integral over C1 and the integral over C3, we get C2 because this just ends up subtracting this one. However, also, we can argue that the contour integral over C3 is going to be zero. And the reason for this is, as you can see, we have, uh, we're encircling this area right here. Um, since this is going clockwise, C3 actually goes in the negative direction. And then this inner curve goes in the positive direction. And what this essentially, uh, causes to happen is that the only area that's actually counted is this area in between them, which is a little bit of an interesting situation. So this area in between is actually um, what counts as inside the contour. And so that can be very useful for a lot of different types of contour integration, and it's going to be the formation of the residue theorem, which we'll learn in the next video. So that means we can argue that the integral over C3 equals zero which means that the integral over c1 is the same as the integral over c2. So as if we have a function that's analytic except for a set of certain points, any curve which um, encircles the same set of those points is going to uh, have the same value, as long as we're going in the same direction. So if we flip the direction, if we went uh, one of them went counterclockwise and one of them went, went clockwise, then they would have uh, then the value of one would be negative the value of the other. So contour deformation is something very important to understand. So if we deform the contour, and so essentially we, we change the shape of the contour, but we have the same points inside of the contour, then the contour, uh, then the integral over that contour does not change. Okay, let's move on to our next topic. Oh, uh, actually, uh, yeah, so one way to sort of internalize the meaning of this the Cauchy's integral theorem, which looks kind of weird. I mean, the integral over a curves, cur closed curve of an analytic function is zero is uh, when you have a closed curve, think about it. You integrate, you start, say, let's say we start right here, and then we go around this curve, right? Oh, sorry about that. We go around this curve, go through this little bend, we come back, and then when we close the curve, we end up at the same point. So it's almost like when we integrate over the real line, if we were to integrate from some point A to some other point A. And of course, that's going to be zero. So that's a sort of reasoning that you can put to um, explain why the integral uh, over a closed curve C is going to be zero for an analytic function. Um, but that's not always going to be the case. This is just a good way to sort of remember when this fun when a uh, contour integral is going to be zero. One other thing I want to note is that it does the definition does say a simply closed curve in in a uh, closed curve C. And what that means is that our curve C can't intersect itself. So we can't have like loop-de-loops or like 
uh, multiple curves that like cross each other, that's that's something that we can't deal with, but it's not something that will ever be useful to us anyway. So a simply connected curve can't intersect with itself. And that's pretty much it for this video. Um, I'm going to have my Discord open, hopefully, so you guys can go join that. And if you have any questions on this or anything that you want me to explain further, I'll be available in the Discord right there. But for now, we have some practice or homework questions that I would absolutely love for you guys to try just to check your understanding and to make sure that you understand everything. So first we have a practice on analytic functions where you just have to find the singular points of f of z. Now we're looking at analytic functions. So these points will be the only points where our function will, will not be analytic. So here are three different values of f of z. c is a little bit more difficult, but I'm sure you guys can figure this out. So go ahead and pause now and try those problems. Problem number two. We're going to choose all of these functions and we're going to classify them as analytic everywhere or nowhere, remembering that certain functions are analytic everywhere, certain functions are analytic nowhere, and um, when we compose those functions, they'll pretty much take on the same, um, they'll pretty much have the same behavior as the inner function, right? So go ahead and classify as all of these functions, analytic everywhere or analytic nowhere. And last of all, we have our practice problems on Cauchy's integral theorem right here. Now, this is some notation that I want you guys to learn. When we have this um, notation right here, uh, I actually forgot the contour integral sign here, but that's okay, um, where you see like absolute value or modulus of z equals one, that's just saying the curve oriented in the clockwise, counterclockwise direction of all the points where the modulus of z equals one. So if you imagine the modulus of z equals one in the complex plane, that just means all the points where the distance from the origin is one. So it's a little circle of radius one. And same thing right here, z minus two i, that would just be all the points that are a distance of one from the point two i in the complex plane. And again, these should have close, um, their orient, the, the path will always be in the counterclockwise direction um, if it's not given to you. So in this case, it's not given to you, so you know that the path is gonna be in the counterclockwise direction. And then for problem three, you're going to tell me which of these problems, which of these integrals can be calculated using Cauchy's integral formula. Reminder that a function has to be analytic everywhere inside the contour to be able to use Cauchy's integral formula. So go ahead and pause and try these three problems. And once you've done that, I'm just going to go ahead and say there's a lot of stuff that we're going to be covering in the next video. So please look out for that one. We're going to be covering the residue theorem, Lorentz series, calculation of residues, essential singularities, and branch points and cuts. So hopefully you guys are ready for that video. And yeah, look out for it. It should come out about two days from this video. Uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please leave any questions for me in the comments or in Discord, and I'll see you next time.